On March 6, 2007, it was reported that three individuals had been banned from Alabama's Talladega National Forest after being caught engaging in certain indecent activities in a clearing near Morgan Lake. There were reports that the three had been involved in numerous such incidents around Morgan Lake, a region well known for this behavior, with explicit photos and videos taken in the area littering the internet. This was not an isolated incident, the forestry patrol captain said. Basically, any time we go up there, we find this going on. The county sheriff, on the other hand, claimed to have, quote, never heard of anything like this. 1,000 miles away in New York City, it was reported that the United States had begun negotiations with North Korea to end the latter's nuclear weapons program and normalize relations between the countries. This is what a year. Welcome to What a Year, the show where we pick a year and spend 10 episodes assembling a time capsule of movies, music, and other cultural odds and ends. I'm Ethan Warren. And I am Ryan Polly. And this week we are talking about our third contributions to the 2007 time capsule, Guy Madden's My Winnipeg and Beirut's album The Flying Club Cup. Plus, I will be testing Ryan on one of the year's top literary prizes. And then I'll be talking to writer and music video scholar Sidney Urbanek about the video for Justin Timberlake's What Goes Around Comes Around. So let's get into it. I want to hear, I can't wait to hear about this guy, this movie, and how the heck this thing came to be. Ah, this, okay. So what I like to do with this movie and with Guy Madden is I like to work backwards. I think that's a lot of fun. Um, from my Winnipeg? From my Winnipeg. So my Winnipeg is, he's he has made movies since then um, that are fantastic. But this is the high point for me. This is my favorite of his. This is one of my favorite movies because there's just nothing like it at all. It's, it's hard to even talk about this movie because it bounces off all of your usual ways of talking about cinema, film, movies, whatever, uh, art. <laughs> so my Winnipeg is a documentary to begin with. It is the documentary channel of Canada came to the esteemed Canadian director and Winnipeg native Guy Madden and said, we would love for you to make a documentary about your city, Winnipeg. And he said, oh, okay. So my, my city. And they were like, yeah, your city. And he's like, but my Winnipeg. That's how I imagine it. It's just like <laughs> underlining the subjectivity again and again. This is Semantics. my Winnipeg. <laughs> this is not the documentary about Winnipeg. And so what he did with this movie is he just said, well, let's make Winnipeg into a place of myth. Winnipeg is the least mythic city in the world. It's just this city that is dumped in the middle of the plains of Canada. It's cold. Not that much is going on there usually. And it's a little bit surreal there. They there that's sort of the the vibe of the city is is at least it, it can be a little bit hard to to distinguish the vibe of the city in my mind from this movie. But my understanding is that these weird little phenomena will pop up in Winnipeg. Do you know about the Winnipeg relationship with Brian De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise? No. Still haven't seen Phantom either. Well, it's a great movie, but it was a, it was absolutely dead on arrival and everywhere on earth except Winnipeg. And it played in Winnipeg for a year. And wow. they still have my they still have a uh, Phantom of the Paradise conventions in Winnipeg just because it came to this movie, it came to this this city rather, and this city is just a bubble in the middle of the Canadian plains and they didn't know that nobody else was worshiping at the altar of this movie. It's just a culture that could bubble and evolve by itself. And so Guy Madden is, is not talking about <laughs> Phantom of the Paradise in particular, though he does have an affinity for that movie and has talked about being in an elevator with Brian De Palma and wanting to just thank him on behalf of Winnipeg. Uh, but so he just said, let's take this weird, sleepy little city and infuse it with all of these myths. And I think some of the stuff is true mm -hmm. uh, in there. Some of the stories that he tells about this city um, a lot of the hockey stuff, all mm -hmm. the hockey stuff. Uh, but also, uh, he would say that everything is true. His whole thing is that this whole movie is 100% truth 
because it is true to how it felt to him. He's huge on this concept of the truth is the feeling of the thing and the facts are less important. How old is he at this point oh, making my Winnipeg? Do you know? I mean, 40s probably. So um, w- when I watched that like live narration video of him mm-hmm. doing it on Criterion, yeah. I forget if it was at Sundance or something. Is that um, around the same time as, as that footage around the same time as when the film came out? Do you know? I would assume so because he, this was initially. Uh, Certainly sounds the same as the narrator. <laughs> that's for sure. But I was yeah. just curious if he would just, he, if he was that age. Yeah. He would tour around with the movie uh, initially, I think before it was turned into the sort of s- distributed form we have now he just would tour with the background footage and he would speak the Mm. entire thing into a microphone it has such a youthful energy is another i I think reason why i'm asking too yeah it it feels very like i don't know like college film genius I, i don't know like scrappy auteur like amateur meets like master yeah i don't know do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so uh, that's yeah. why I'm kind of curious about that too. Well, it's it's got a collagey feel. It's it's a movie that has a lot of anxious energy and feels like it's almost trying to like escape itself at points. The the silent film uh, title cards will be like shaking and a little bit like uh-huh. jumping at the screen, and I just I see this really anxious energy, this coiled. Because his whole thing is is the conceit of the movie is that Guy Madden, who we see on the train, played by another person. <laughs> Yeah, uh, is trying to escape his city and fight off sleepwalking because if he knows if he falls asleep, the train that he is on will turn around and he'll end up back where he started. And so there's this tension as he's trying to keep himself awake, literally. (laughs) And the movie is almost existing in his sort of hazy dreamscape. Mm -hmm. Um, I care about this stuff so much. I'm getting like chills all over my body as we talk about it. I love that. I love that. It's so funny how like little this movie seems to impact well, by the way, just to, just to insert myself quickly there, I just want to say this this film blew me away, and and I am in awe of its of of its sheer existence, um, and I'm so glad you brought this film into my life. I'm so it's it, it it's one of those films where it's like you immediately want to start reading about it, you immediately want to start asking questions, and I'm so glad I get to do that. So just to get get it out of the way, I, this is not going to be one of the episodes where I'm disagreeing <laughs> with how important and amazing this film truly is. I'm absolutely my mind is blown the amount of style that it has. That's it, it's like a film school's worth of references and stylistic techniques and still it just feels like uh, like a like getting to know a, an artist so yeah. so you know that's that's like kind of what i got from it it's like i i know this person a little bit now and it's fascinating well and just ideas inside of ideas inside of ideas so in addition to what we have with he is sleepy on a train and we're hearing and seeing stories that may or may not be true um we are also guy madden used his money from the documentary channel at least so he says in the movie and so he purports to be true he hired uh actors to portray his own family rented out his um childhood home and had his own mother portray herself in these reenactments the only thing is the woman playing his mother is the only recognizable actress in the movie so he is insisting it is his own mother, but it is in fact Anne Savage, who is a classic sort of noir actress. Which is crazy to me because she plays it as if she's not an actress. Mm-hmm. She's which so is, good. Which made me assume that she was not. Yeah. So I, I didn't recognize her. I, I don't know. Who is Anne Savage? She's just a, a face from those sort of classic 40s and, and 50s noirs. Cool. Um, cool. And so he's he's playing on that association. Yeah, he wants he wants to continue to explore the middle ground between truth and and reality, totally. and fiction and story, and and he'll he'll do that down to yeah, saying that it's his mother. Yeah, that that makes sense to me. And then there's these metaphors and these symbols, like the father is exhumed and put under the rug so that his presence will be there even though he's dead. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just, I, I love all of these little intricate true, but not true, but that just makes it the more true things. So one thing about this movie, it is, it's the culmination of a trilogy of memoir movies, 
by Guy Madden, all playing with the form of silent melodrama. I'm not as familiar with his stuff before these three, and I'm not as familiar with the stuff after. Though I have seen a lot of it, these are the ones I sort of obsess over. They're all feature length? All feature length, but short features. He tends to work in the sort of 70, 80 minute range. Yeah. Um, And so the one before this, again, working backwards, which I like to do, uh, is called Brand Upon the Brain. And he says, this movie is either 99 or 100% my true life. This is the true story of my growing up. And it is about, um, it takes place on an island with a uh, lighthouse on it. And it's sort of long, long in the past. And there's these two little siblings who are running around <laughs> having like adventures and their mother is evil. And she turns into a monster. If she does not extract <laughs> the like s- uh, nectar from little children. True story. True story. This is my actual autobiography. And he said, <laughs> he'll say like, I had to go like I, during shooting, I would have to step away to cry because it was like just seeing my true life there on oh, screen. Man. And so this is his whole thing is he's pushing you and pushing you to say like, like Kaufman esque. This is true. This is the tr- cause, cause I, what you see in this uh, brand upon the brain is the mother transforms into a psychotic monster and starts confronting the sister and screaming at her about sexual indiscretion and stuff, yeah. which you then yeah. see again in my Winnipeg. It's he is taking his experiences and just filtering them through these stylized layers to say what, what emerges, what comes out, what if it's a monster movie? Or then the movie before that is called Cowards Take the Knee and is a ghost story involving uh, hockey and Greek tragedy. Um, And again, you're seeing the same archetypes come back again and again, characters with the same names. Uh, His father is a much more present figure in, in Cowards Bend the Knee and it's sort of halfway to being his father. And... It's just this beautiful, weird experiment that I see as as these. He he is is fascinated in my Winnipeg by the the forks beneath the forks and the lap beneath the lap, and yeah. and this idea that there are layers of sort of mythic meaning that the deeper down you get, the more sort of you get to something real and primal. And I love that idea, and I love this tower he built. And then he, you can go even all the way to the basement, <laughs> and uh, read a. a never made movie called uh, The Child Without Qualities, which is his straightforward, actual, true autobiography that he never even bothered making. It's just the Mm. realistic story of the Madden family. And one thing that is so crucial to getting him and getting his whole shtick with these movies is how much younger he is than his siblings and how much older his parents were by the time they had him. So he says... When I was born, they brought me home and they put me down facing in the wrong direction. And I have been looking backwards my entire life because he felt that his family's prime had passed before he was born. And so he's filled with this nostalgia for something he never experienced. And I think that is this sort of melancholy that comes through in all of this. But you don't know any of that. And when, when you're watching this movie and the movie is still impacting you. So I'd love to know sort of what it is that was exciting you was it just the form no humor big was big i found myself like chuckling and really appreciating yeah it's a very silly movie it was yeah Yeah. so and i think that kept me yeah in my seat was the jokes um and the style it, it was so exciting Felt like so exciting and so fresh and so, yeah, nothing like it. Um, trying to, f- yeah, figure out what it was and what I thought of it. I mean, the family stuff, I think, was was probably the stuff that I'll remember. That and the hockey stuff, probably the most. What about the hockey stuff spoke to you? Because are you, are you a hockey fan? I grew up playing hockey. Um and the idea of like looking back at the sport and being like it was different or like they cared or like you know like i don't know there's just something something about the the old blankets and the hockey and like the tradition of winnipeg 
that and all that old the footage that he created of those old guys skating that was another thing is was was there were certain shots even where it was like so easy to tell that it was a recreation but then of the same shot he would switch to different footage where i wouldn't have been able to tell you that that wasn't an old movie yeah of the same actor so he was playing with my perception of what was going on to certain points thinking that this was old footage and then he would cut to something that was like oh is that digital or like is why is it in color now or like you know like and and that continues to i think uh support what you were saying about just like kind of his thesis which is like when you enter my world i promise i'm going to tell you the truth doesn't mean like here's the facts you know it means he's going to be real he's going to be himself and he's going to tell you things that i mean the movie is the film is very vulnerable um and yeah i don't know yeah it's kind of he's kind of out yeah all out on the line like he he just yeah i would say that's something i connect to it to with it on too is just how how vulnerable it is how raw it is Um, i I think it's it's really uh, telling that the shot he puts in first is is uh, him directing. You don't actually see him on screen, but you hear him mm. uh, trying to coax the performance out of Anne Savage as his mother during one of the fight scenes. And it's mm-hmm. it seems like this acknowledgement that like I am genuinely in too deep here. Um, I am I am pr- sure. pretending to be in too deep because that's the conceit of the script. But also when I'm working with my performer. It is so important to me that this come out exactly how I remembered it. It's, it does feel like genuinely he needed to get something out of his system here. And so I think you're right. There's, there's a vulnerability to circling back around and coming as close as he could to telling his true story. Uh, probably was nerve wracking, especially as we learned his sister is like a local uh, sports legend and he's, you know, getting into the, getting into the weeds with some of what she and, and uh, his mom were butting heads over. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I love what you said about like when you watch like, um, what is that film? Uh, American, the documentary about the guy make wants to make the horror movies. Oh, uh, American movie. Yeah. When, you know, like you could watch that film and walk away from it and be like, that guy was crazy, huh? Or like that guy was obsessed and like delusional, huh? And I think there's something about this film too where like he, it's pretty brave to make something like that and and know that some people are going to write your art off pretty quickly and be like, meh, like this is weird, you know? And like, I can't believe you spent so much of your life doing this or like so much of your time exploring these things with your mother publicly or, you know, like all that kind of stuff or that you told a documentary that you took money from them and told them you're going to make, I don't know. Like he's just one of those very artists for artists sake and, and, and very appreciated by me as an artist for taking all those risks. And, um, and yeah, I think he, I think he gives his all and in, into his vision. I mean, how do you know how much of that movie may, uh, uh, cost to make? Oh, I have and no like idea how, how he how he makes them or like what is going on with the style. Like, how do you even could you tell me a paragraph about what the style is? It is it is is the narration noir like detective type of narration? I couldn't I couldn't grasp, but it almost read like like the smoky streets and the the cigarettes were lit. Yeah, and it yeah. was ten o'clock, mm-hmm. and I walked in, and my babe was on the couch with us. You know, like and, and she was dead. It's hard boiled. Like, it, it yeah, kinda, that's what. You're you're yeah, well, so uh, maybe I don't know. Tell me what I'm saying. Like, what is the style of this film, and what is striking slash familiar? And talk to me about like kind of like it seems like this huge melting pot to me of style and genre. Um, but I, I I was too overwhelmed to pick up on it all. And I'm guessing having seen it a bunch and knowing a lot about film, I, I kind of want to hear what's what's going on in your head of, uh, and what he's doing stylistically. So hard boiled is is definitely the term for the kind of narration you're describing. And there is a lot of that um, 50s vibe in the home stuff, the the stuff with the family, um, which is a little out of step with the rest of the trilogy. And 
the the balance of my Winnipeg is is so much about silent melodrama, and that is what all three of the movies are messing with. Is yeah, specifically silent film from the you know tens and twenties and um, melodrama, which he thinks is this very valuable art form because it allows you to be more again truthful with emotion. Because he says, you know, can you define melodrama for our listeners? And totally not for me. <laughs> yes, of course. I know what it is. Yeah, it's just the the um, extremely extremely heightened emotions, the wailing, and the if you're sad, you're sobbing, and if you're happy, you're ecstatically beaming. And it's it's the um, a melodrama is a soap opera. It's a something where the 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 peaks of drama are going to be very very high, and a little bit a little bit cheap. Um, you know, melodramatic is, is not a compliment, you know, in a work of art. Usually if it was melodramatic, it's unearned sentiment. Uh, but over time, you know, melodrama becomes very, uh, the melodramas of the past, I think become very appealing very quickly because there is, there is a certain unbridled emotion to them. Uh, David Lynch is playing a lot with melodrama Mm because in a very similar way, he is using the permission to have characters scream and sob in order to to sort of crank up the intensity and crank up the realness and make you uncomfortable. And so that, I think, is what you're responding to. And I think the narration is an extension of that. Um, and so he's he's with this, he's fusing the silent film with the 50s stuff with melodrama as the through line, I guess, which is cool. So it's, so it's less of a style pot than I thought well, you kind of mostly see silent. That's mostly what you're saying. He's riffing on. Well, but then also there's shadow puppet stuff. Um, yeah, there, that's true. there is color digital video footage of the, um, arena, uh, which again, I think is very deliberately. He's, he's using this much more blank, flat, drab uh footage to sort of ironically counterpoint how beautiful the past stuff is Mm -hmm. um and also a lot of it is just guy madden like you can't describe some of this stuff as as comparable to anything but just him and you see a lot of people ripping him off um especially in canada uh you know there's I think he is an influential figure up there in a way he maybe isn't down here. He's probably big in Winnipeg. He is big in Winnipeg. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, do, do you think the documentary company was mad? I think you know. Or I think, think they, they knew. They were happy to support. Yeah, they were happy. They knew what they were getting. I think into. you know they, what you're getting into when you hire Guy Madden. Um, okay. And also, this okay. movie was made for half a million. You asked uh, earlier. I looked it up. It's it's okay. You know, five hundred thousand dollars, and I bet a lot of it is just shot in a studio. He probably has a studio where he just constructs. Um, you know, sure. a lot of this stuff. And sure. uh, these are probably old cameras he's using. Um, so they're expensive probably to get your hands on, but then you got them. I, I you know, you're not renting yeah. out a, uh, you know, Ari Flex or whatever. So one thing uh, that I wanted to touch on was, was whether it bothered you to not be sure what was true or not as you were watching, was it sort of, a, a sort of itchy thing for you to to wonder is this story true is no, this one made up no no that's no. good because because i because i don't think i'd I, I don't think i'd be as stoked if you sent me a documentary about winnipeg well, f- fair enough i don't think you i would have yeah mean? like i think yeah I, I think i knew from watching the trailer when you sent it to me that this was gonna like be surreal yeah you know which i like i told you is something i really look for in a movie i mean we talk we keep talking about these albums of being these places to visit and some a lot of film is like i'm visiting la oh i'm here i am visiting la in this month here i am visiting you know and it just like takes place in the real world and even though this is very real to him um you know it had a very surrealistic quality and a very dreamlike quality as you said so that was something i really appreciated about it um no the only thing frustrating about it was just like how repressed he was or like how like repression was like this town was just like keeping him down or like that he just it i don't know it just felt like my frustration was with his frustration i think i think it i think the movie has a frustrated tone and that feeling of not knowing if you're asleep or not or like 
you know, like that's not the most comfortable feeling mm-hmm. of like being like, I don't know what's real. Like, am I asleep? Like, this is weird. Like in my dreams, a lot of the time I'm like, am I drunk? I remember thinking in my dreams, like, am I drunk? Like what's going on? Yeah. So like, it, it kind of has that feeling of just like kind of, yeah, dream like walking into different scenes in the past and it's black and white. It's, you know, very surreal. So yeah. that was really great, but it's a stressed yeah, out no, didn't, movie. Didn't mind. I think mm-hmm. it's, it's mm-hmm. the, the, he, by the end, he's fantasizing about having a superhero um, who is uh, whoever that actress is. Call me. <laughs> Uh, the the uh, superhero that he <laughs> evokes who will that's right oh my gosh she was one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen yeah, in my yeah. life who who will save Winnipeg from itself um, that's so interesting that you said that because I was like wow Ethan doesn't usually say those that kind of thing <laughs> especially on a podcast and then I was like I now and then I just remembered oh my gosh she was like striking and memorable well no she's for gonna the ages. she's gonna call me so that we can do an interview for this show because oh okay oop, that, obviously oops. as a yep. as a married That's what I happily meant married yes. man there's no other reason <laughs> that I would ever want her to call me yeah yeah um yeah no she was very beautiful another thing that I I have, am just so interested by is, is Guy Madden's most recent movie, which I think tells mm. you a lot about what his priorities are. And um, so his most recent movie was called the green fog. And I've, and he's in his sixties now. I mean, probably he's in his uh, fi- Yeah. Okay. Um, green fog. The green, you said? the green fog, which I have not made it all the way through because what it is, Guy Madden is 65 years old. Um, the green fog is a remake of vertigo. Hitchcock's Vertigo, but assembled entirely out of clips from other movies. And so what you are watching is a feature length. It will be a clip from some old noir, and then it will be a clip from some nineties action movie, and then some seventies cheesecake thing. And he is a student of form and a student of story in the most abstract way. And so just the fact that he graced us with, with the amount of story and humor and heart that he did with this movie, I think is what makes it so satisfying because just by virtue of him being him, there's always going to be this explosive level of uh, ideas and stylistic ideas. And this is the one that actually is not as hard to sort of sit through sure. as some of the yeah. other more intensely cerebral ones. Because it does, there is something very close to the surface. The vulnerability that you identified, which I wouldn't necessarily have identified, um, I think is is what makes this really special. And maybe that's yeah. kind of, I just kind of stumbled into my closing argument on this, I think. Um, is I love all of his stuff, but some of it is harder to sit through than this. And this one has a really coherent heart to it that I love. Awesome. And it happened to come out in 2007 it did but it's one that i discovered much later i think it's it's the oh yeah so you weren't watching this in 2007 i wasn't i wasn't watching it until it hit the criterion collection um which probably would have been been around 2014 or so um seven years later yeah and i feel like um in 2007 like probably hearing about new indie movies and like just get the exposure that you would get to a new indie would be way less, I would think, than it would be now. Well, like that's to, true. To yeah. be like, oh, this, there's a cool project going on, and when this guy and when you know, yeah. it's like, you know, probably maybe a smaller, smaller reach. I think the A V Club was kind of hot on him always, and the, hey, and great. the Dissolve, um, you know, by the time that was out there, was was hot on him, and so they they I'd were love to say our out. friends over at the A V Club, but I, I don't know them. I just admire them. They're amazing. Right. So shout out to yeah, them. yeah. And I hope they're doing okay. <laughs> they are they are in the midst right now of a really ugly corporate takeover. So Oh no. Yeah, it's it's Okay, well our thoughts go out to they, the A V Club. Oh, writers, they really, so, really do. Because they're some of the best yeah. the best writers. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. I mean, if you talk about two thousand seven, you're talking about the A V Club for me. I mean, goddamn, they were yeah. they were the ones pointing me in all the right directions. I wasn't there yet. No, oh um, God! I mean, I don't think so. The, I think till after college. I think is when I started reading it every day. Well, this is a total digression, but 2007 was just so the height of the TV recap for me, and that was so oh, cool, huge. Think about like for what shows we haven't Lost. even talked about what shows were on, and oh my, it was gosh, for Lost. Yes. TV Wait, recaps for Lost. It was then maybe I did read the AV. 
It was Entertainment Weekly. I was Weekly. on Lostpedia. Yeah. I was on... Jeff, oh, yeah. Jeff EW Jensen was, at Entertainment Weekly. EW yeah. was huge with Lost. They would do the whole like new season photos. They would do like, yeah. But week oh to week... Gosh, 2007 was Lost. Yeah, week to week, he would be taking it and just sort of expanding every like, oh, Sawyer is reading Watership Down. And here's 2,000 words on why Watership Down is actually really important to Lost. And wow. it just made the show feel so big and like this world to get lost in. And so 2007, just the peak of that for me in the AV club, a huge part of that. And, and this weird little what is bubble. His name? Uh, who? The writer? Oh, Jeff Jensen at Entertainment Weekly. Doc Jensen was he, huge. He wasn't part of the um, AV club, though. No, right? he wasn't. wasn't just, no. Um, okay. Yeah. Good times. Good times on the internet. Yeah. Okay. We're throwing it in. Throw it in. We're, yeah. Let's Chuck it. throw it in the time capsule. And it's, it's, it's weird because it's like you could put, you know, Hot Rod goes into the time capsule because it represents comedies for me. This does not represent mm-hmm. anything. This goes in because yeah. it's an anomaly and it deserves to just be put in amber. I'm not sure what it represents except just sometimes beautiful things can exist in the world. So there it goes. I threw it. Nice. I can't believe they're still bouncing like that. Yeah. I can't either. Good for them. I think about it all the time. Good for them. I lie awake at night <laughs> thinking about it. Well, that was enjoyable, wasn't it? It was. Do you want to do you want to do a pop quiz? I would love to do a pop quiz, especially because it's going to be sexy. No, it's not. It's explicitly not going to be sexy. Uh, I would recommend it's going to be sexist. No, well, we'll see. I would recommend our sex. listener hit the 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 jump ahead button a couple of times because we're going to get into the Bad Sex in Fiction Award, which is an award that is given out in honor of the worst written sex scenes in all of literature every year. <laughs> and so I'm going to give you the three finalists for 2007's <laughs> bad sex in fiction awards. And you have to guess which was the worst sex in fiction for 2007. <laughs> Wait, sex in fiction, bad sex in fiction award. Good band name. You just got to tell me which one won the prize for the worst sex scene in any work of fiction that year. Okay. So we're talking a sex scene not just in a movie or television specifically in like a novel in, in oh it's specifically in a novel specifically okay. in a novel yes so i'm going to read you these passages and you just have to say oh these are going to be really great which is the I can't worst one you signed up to, to do this <laughs> oh well it's not they're actually they are not exceptionally graphic because these are these are writers who were trying to write literature and if you are trying to write okay. literature and you need to describe the act of human <laughs> sex you run into certain challenges I, Hey, don't bother me. I'm writing literature. So, for example, this person needed to write a fictionalized life of William Shakespeare, and they needed to write a sex scene (laughs) between William Shakespeare and his wife, Anne Hathaway. Uh, (laughs) Did you know that Shakespeare's wife was named Anne Hathaway? (laughs) <laughs> that's no that's that's the that's the fiction no it's true in real no it's in not. real life well i have because no, i'm gonna not. have to say it, it. so here we go far beneath me now anne hathaway's body began to <laughs> rage and founder in the rising foam as i clung like a mariner to her heaving haunches <laughs> till at last the moment came when some colossal wave flung her up high and i held on for my life and she screamed loud and long <laughs> Clung like a mariner. Yep, it's all. And she screamed loud and long. And it goes on. It's it. There's it goes on a lot farther after that about the boat metaphor, but I cut it off because I was like, if I keep reading this, he's going to think they're actually on a boat. And they're not. They're not. He just he went all in on this boat metaphor. So that's number one. So explain to me one more time why. Um, someone wrote a fan fiction about billy shakespeare and anne hathaway the actress they wrote a novel because because no one's ever going to go broke writing about shakespeare basically i don't know (laughs) i don't i haven't read this book but anne hathaway is not the name of shakespeare's wife. it very much is and you could look that up if you want to that's mind-blowing does anne know that is that why she changed her name to annie i suspect she does know it i suspect it's come up in her life i think that was the best headline of last year what was like Anne Hathaway to now go by Annie. Does she? That's not a headline I saw. 
Oh, it was so good because it read like, um, like, um, Juno actor, Elliot. Oh, Page. Elliot Page. It read yeah. like, it read like that. Oh headline. God. <laughs> okay. But it was like, Anne. It, you know what I mean? Right, right, right. Cause, Cause you're used to seeing them and it, and it says Anne Hathaway now to go by Annie. Right. And you click through and it's like, Anne wants to be called Annie now. And you're like, wait, that's wait, why did I click through? Like, why is this a news, news story? And also that didn't work. It seems cause she's, everyone <laughs> yeah, still calls her Anne. She's Hathaway. definitely. Anne yeah. Hathaway. Forever. <laughs> First last name for other two. All right. Well, All right, okay. We get, so that, I give that an A plus. So move on. To the All right. We got one. two more. Um, I, I, I feel bad crediting these, but this is from a novel called girl meets boy by a writer named Allie Smith. Cause this girl meets boy. Right. I was a she, was a he, was a we, were a girl and a girl and a boy and a boy. We were blades, we were a knife that could cut through myth. We're two knives thrown by a magician, were arrows fired by a god. We had a heart, we had a home, we were the tail of a fish, we were the reek of a cat, we're the beak of a bird, we're the feather that mastered gravity, we're high above every landscape, then down deep in the purple haze of the heather, we're Roman in the gloaming in a brash unending Scottish piece of perfect jigging reeling, <laughs> real, can we really keep this up, question mark. And it goes on and on and on and on. <laughs> But I stopped there. <laughs> you you read that really well. <laughs> I practiced. I really liked. Yeah, it was really really good. Thank that you. That was really really good. Thank you. Thank you. Because that was yeah. Your 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 prep work there went a long way. All right, and one more. This <laughs> one's by Norman Mailer from a novel called The Castle in the Forest. Clara turned head to foot and put her most unmentionable part down on his hard breathing nose and mouth. <laughs> and took his old battering ram into her lips. Uncle was now as soft as a coil of excrement. Wait, what? Wait, what? Wait is uncle the same guy that she's going down on or a different I th guy? I think. Oh, it's the same guy. I think uncle is his she name. Finished. She finished. I don't know. <laughs> that's the worst one to me. So that's your, is that your guess? That's like, again, we do this podcast because of our opinions mm -hmm. and we just respect each other's opinions. We're not asking anyone else to respect our opinions, but we respect each other's opinions. And so we talk about things and we like to talk about things and, and, and hear what each other thinks. And I think that that is the worst by far. Well, I think the other, the second one was the worst writing, like, and you really sold that, but also was kind of, had a kind of lyricism to it. Mm -hmm. When you, it seems like you respected it enough to want to read it more than once. Yeah. And um, the third, the last one, I would never like to hear ever, ever, ever again. Well, the the committee agrees so, with you because that was that was yeah. the winner of the bad sex and fiction. All right. And the all right. The quote from the assistant editor uh, over there said it <laughs> it was the excrement that tipped the balance. <laughs> comparing comparing your your genitals to excrement is apparently the way to win. That one just unsettled me in a deep deep way. And then the he, the guy goes on. There was another line about being ready at last to grind into her with the hound, drive it into her piety. Uh, yeah, like, the battering ramp. Yeah, 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 it was so like aggressive and blunt. Ugh. So there you go. That's that's this week's quiz. You you did it. You won. So you have to get yourself something on eBay now. I think that was the rule you set up the first time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you didn't remind me last episode to buy something on eBay. Well, I have to buy a bunch of stuff on eBay. You're now. gonna so have I got to. Rowling. Well, no, I, you didn't because did she did. she didn't win. Oh, that's right. But I did I did identify them. So I got I got past the first round. There right? you go. Yes, you no, you killed yeah, it. Yeah. This season of What a Year is brought to you by Mubi, which is, you have heard me say it before, you're going to hear me say it again, they are my absolute favorite streaming service. And I know what you're thinking, this is a podcast ad and that little skip ahead button is calling out to you, but I am calling out to you too and I am saying do not skip, listen to this one because I have some really cool stuff to tell you about, including a fantastic project that Mubi is doing this summer. 
But first things first, I, I hope that you already know what Mubi is, but if you don't, they are a curated streaming service that shows exceptional films from around the globe. They have an amazing library of films, and then they premiere a new film every single day, and it might be from an iconic director or an emerging auteur. But either way, you're going to get a little email every day telling you about some amazing movie that personally I have, I've usually never even heard of, but suddenly cannot wait to watch. And this isn't some machine that's making suggestions based on what you've browsed before. These are hand-selected movies curated by people who really love and care about film. So as they say, with Mubi, you get your own personal film festival streaming anytime, anywhere. But that's not all. Uh, I mentioned a fantastic new project for Mubi, and that is season two of the acclaimed audio documentary series Mubi Podcast. This season focuses on movie theaters because, as they say, in a time when too many cinemas are shutting down, it is time to lift them up. So every episode this season tells the story of one individual movie theater that had some huge impact on film history or just on history in general. And now I get to go off script. I have hit all the official talking points. So I just get to tell you personally that it has been such a total genuine joy discovering this show this summer. I honestly cannot wait to start any new episode uh, I just listened to episode three, and it is, it's is—it's this beautiful story about a scrappy little underdog theater in suburban Minnesota that just happened to become ground zero for the cult of Harold and Maude. This movie was DOA everywhere except this one town in Minnesota who just, like, loved it back to life. And I'm so into this kind of story, these weird little phenomena that, like, pop up in unexpected places, you know, like the way that Brian De Palma's Phantom of the Paradise is huge in Winnipeg for whatever reason— but I had never heard this story, and I'm a huge Harold and Maude fan, and this whole thing had just totally missed me. And then the episode becomes this beautiful portrait of like a homegrown phenomenon that sort of shaped cultural history and helped cement the whole entire concept of a cult movie. And it's this perfect little slice of Americana with all these unexpected details, and it's all just told with such care and craft, and they are just doing such amazing work with this show. You've, you've got to check it out. You can get it wherever you get your podcast. That's Mubi Podcast on uh, all your favorite podcast services. And I swear I would be saying all of that even if Mubi was not sponsoring this show. But since they are sponsoring the show, I get to tell you that listeners to What A Year can try Mubi for free for 30 days at Mubi.com slash What A Year. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash What A Year. You will get a month of great cinema for free. And honestly, people, what could be better than that? I will have more about Mubi every episode this season, and I cannot wait to tell you more. But in the meantime, back to the show. Let's talk about some music, huh? All right, let's do it. Let's talk about the Flying Club Cup, which feels like it should be called the Flying Cup Club. Why do you say that? Because it, it should just be called the something club. That's just what our brains say it should be. No, no, you're right. The club, the club, I've always called it the wrong one. Yeah. But it's interesting that you agree and not, it's just like, usually it's someone being like, no, it's not, you're getting it wrong. Oh. But you're like, yeah, you're right. It should be the other one. But I'm trying to understand why. I just think it's, it, our, our brains are programmed to think of, especially in a title, the Babysitter's Club. Yeah. You know? The, the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants Club. club. Yeah. The, the Bucket List Club with Jack Nicholson. The Yaya Sisterhood Club. Right. You're just thinking of you're just thinking of ensemble movies with women in it now. <laughs> the Now and Then Club, the Sex in the City 13. Club. <laughs> What's the new one that just came out? The three fifty five or the something? The three fifty five. It's club. like just a yeah. number. No, it doesn't have club, but they are a club. I think the three fifty five um, Club Cup. <laughs> so I think it's Flying Club cup because they're in a flying club where they fly planes and then the, the the trophy that they're trying to win is called the flying club cup and hope but it's it's it must be only just pilots against other members of the club it must you know it's interclub yes. it's an intramural okay anyway let's talk about the music zach condon oh man speaking of myth 
it was it was it's 2007 i think it was it was way easier to be like um anonymous like you know animal collective had an an, an, an anonymity to them and beirut definitely too and especially when you think about what it sounds like and unknown uh mortal orchestra i forget when they kind of came onto the scene but it was a similar thing where like it wasn't press photos weren't like it was like cooler to have like a press photo where you're like under a blanket or you know like or like so so the so it was and this music when i heard it was you very much want to know who the heck was making what and when especially when you realize it was a kid like in his bedroom so that was like the story with their first record um gulag orchestra which like you know i think i i was obsessed with you know and um and flying club cub <laughs> man can we just call it the second album? yeah yeah it's fine i'm sorry i did this to you <laughs> no the second one's good it's really really good it but it's it's not as perfect as the first one um the perf- the first one i would say is like a miracle it's like it's like comparing neon bible to funeral like the second one is an expansion on what he did it's it's more produced in ways um which i would argue takes away a little bit from it um but also it's going to be hard to you know it's more accessible when you produce his vocal well. So that's why on a, like Sunday Smile and like on a few of the singles, his voice is very up front and center. Where on some of the other ones, it's more like, you know, room tone, vocals and harmonies and, you know, but still, still in Beirut fashion, you know, the, the, the song structures are untraditional. The orchestration is, um, you know, in origin way more european sounding and and not i don't mean like the uk or like westernized europe i mean like you know traditional eastern hungarian music and french music and the instrumentation is the way he does horns i can i there is no better horns oh my goodness his horn writing is so gorgeous and yeah, I mean, I forget how how young he is, but he's very young. And he, and 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 like, I I I got into the whole myth of it and tried to find everything out I could on him. I remember in college, like I was I was really into this band. And um, he was he went to school in New Mexico, uh, but it, he definitely spent some time, him and his brother, I believe, in Europe. Like he definitely was, you know, because he, and and it must just be the music that he loves. I mean, he's very much this like street troubadour with this like band of um i don't know like i don't know who these people are like these people who know how this tradition of music that 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 most people especially within the american indie context don't really know about so it's it's very new for the listener even though it's not new to him these are rich tradition that's, that he's playing off of but to the context of american indie these are these are untouched territories so to combine the pop songwriting tradition and the idea of seeing this band play on the same set as like our same show as like grizzly bear you know but to, but to, these influences are are unheard of you know they're they're just they're incredible and they and 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 yeah the production's amazing and and this record is really really strong with some very very high highs um specifically the title track specifically nanta um and then for me some some that leave me you know desiring the first record a little bit but that's okay this record rules and it definitely would go in because you know if if the like we always say if the first record didn't exist then this would be the best one you know like sure it, yeah. it does so it's the second best but it's still great yeah in terms of how old he is he's 21 years old when this comes out this guy hot is damn. hot diggity damn he is three or four months older than me i just looked it up so when i am hearing this music for the first time in 2007 i am he's hearing your age making it exactly which is i didn't know at the time because I remember discovering this and it felt so alien. It felt like I was, I was so energized by this stuff the first time I encountered it. Um, except that's not true. Um, I was devastated the first time I encountered it. Yeah, which would have been in real time. I mean, we both were listening to this in 2007 for no, sure. No, do you not know the way I discovered this fucking band? 
No. My girlfriend, who's now my wife, uh, was going off to study abroad in India uh, in 2000, the fall of 2008. And I was, I had said goodbye to her for the, I wasn't going to see her for four months or whatever, drove back to my apartment. I was crying, miserable. And you said, well, here's a great song. I'm going to give you a great song to hear (laughs) and then you'll feel good. And I click it and it starts. It's been a long time, a long time now since I've seen you smile. And it was devastating. And I, but at the same time I was like, well, this is one of my favorite songs. I can't believe this exists. And then I, what I really yeah. remember is the videos. Do you know, like the the DVD, whatever it's called? Uh, um, no, the the vlog attack videos. You mean? Oh well, there's those. Yeah. Um, the what, what DVD are you talking about? There's there's some DVD uh, that he would I don't sell think at I, shows. Yeah, no, I don't think I was hip to it. And now it's it's online. Um, it's cool. it's just the same the same vibe as the what what did you say the blogotech the takeaway shows blogotech yeah yeah Vincent Moon just him out in the street uh, playing with with the real sort of instrumentalists right. walking around and and sort like of like an accordionist exactly right? yeah a couple horns players maybe even some string players walking around with him just like that traditional pop orchestration yeah I yeah. I just found that so electrifying I remember in two thousand seven yeah. and it made this stuff feel doable to me and actually got me experimenting. Um, I think probably this, oh, this was a huge cool. influence on that. Cause it's just like, yeah, I, I, I didn't know that on the first album he was playing all the instruments, but maybe it's sort of detectable, this feeling that it's being cobbled together track by track yeah. by one guy. Yeah. yeah. No, it's one of those lo-fi records where it's like, um, it seems so obvious to just create but you don't you don't you forget that you can do it until somebody shows you that you can do it and yeah. he was definitely someone for me too that was just like it's not the instrument it's not you know the recording console it's not it's the person you know and that's what makes the art good and and it would and and albums have shown different albums have shown me that in my life and don't get me wrong on my top 10 albums of all time there's going to be records that i absolutely love the production of um, and they're highly produced albums, but then I love the production on his records because it, it's so personal and honest and authentic and genuine and real and, um, and yeah, more vulnerable art too, huh? Um, that's, that's, that, that made me so happy to, where you were like, no, actually like, you know, we weren't listening to it at the same time. Like, and I thought you were going to say someone else showed you and then it came back around and it turned out that I showed you and that makes me so happy. Um, Cause yeah, I was, I was, I was, yeah, more than dipping my toes into being a Beirut fan at the time. Um, and I think when you're like, when you're really sad, you don't want to, a sad song. Yeah. Like that's one thing, but you don't want that feeling of like, oh, so random, like, <laughs> like a happy song, like, you know, like, so I bet. You know, you needed a song like that, not like a song that's I like guess so. super sunshiny at yeah. the time. It, well, it, it put it, it put words to something I was feeling, certainly. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I could then go around with that line in my head, and I didn't have to think of my own line. So yeah. thank you for that, Zach. Yeah. Yeah, what a talent. Um, and then there's also um, that story about like how he has problems playing guitar, and what is that story that pushed him like um tendon issues or some issues where you know he, it's really not super comfortable for him to be playing guitar and so that pushed him to other instruments and um not to, to, to more rely on them as a um you know probably knowing that he could just express himself with a guitar but like, ow, my hands hurt. I guess I'm going to express myself on this ancient horn that I know how to play or, you know, like, I don't know, like the textures are brilliant and, um, yeah, very, very magical. I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what else to say about it. I mean, well, I have a question. I will always, yeah, yeah, please. Well, no, you will always what? Well, I will always cherish this record and the record that came before it as like this slice of very much you know reminds me of that time in my life this the year that we're talking about like it very much fe- i remember being you know like some of these projects some of these projects we're talking about they don't bring me back exactly to a place from like yep 2007 like there i am like i you know quite as much as maybe this one does like 
this this was that I when I remember I I can picture the library, you know, for some reason like I can picture a college library when I think about this record because yeah. I was listening to it all the time. So, um, so yeah, that that so yeah, big and and then at the, also at the time there was um this this app, um, on that somehow made it so that if you downloaded it on your computer at school, um, you could upload your music library and then anyone else who had the app and did the same could take any music from you and they, and you, they could take, and you could take anything from them. And so like, um, like some kids we went to school with would have like super dialed taste and have, you know, 20 to 40 demo, demo tracks from Beirut that had never been released or like Grizzly Bears, um, Vacuum to Miss before it came out. Like some, there were some kids that we went to school with that were like super dialed that like, yeah, like turned me on to some, some, some buried stuff that like was happening at the time. Um, and that's like, yeah, it gets back to that whole like file sharing thing of going from albums to songs and stuff, but also albums. Yeah. Albums that, that, that were leaking somehow, I guess that's what it was at the time was leaks. Does that make sense? Right? Like albums would leak it, and you'd yeah, be able to hear yeah. them before they like, you know, they were finally mixed and they would end up sounding better when you'd hear them. But, you know, in rainbows probably never leaked, but like maybe the Flea Foxes album would or something, you know, like I think at that time, yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, any listener, but at that time it was, it wasn't rare to be like, dude, you can hear it. It's not out. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, it was, it was uh, a little bit, less of i think a um there were probably less sophisticated ways of tracking who was sharing what at that time um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i don't know my mind goes straight yeah. to the fact that x-men origins wolverine came out in its unfinished form on file sharing the next a year or two later right oh wow i would forgotten about that yeah a whole leaked movie i think that was that was a rare case but yeah 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 maybe there was a That's little more of that crazy. yeah you ever seen them live Beirut? No, have you? Once, but not in an ideal setting. I believe it was at the Hollywood Bowl. Mm. So it was this very intimate, um, you know, the whole the whole thing about Beirut is they sound so big for how small it is, right? And that's so charming to be in this wooden room, this cabin where someone's playing, you know, uh, there's like six horn players and a, and a, and a harmonium player and a accordion player and this guy's singing and it's, and there's like a fire and, you know, people are drinking wine into the morning and you're just like, how the hell did this come together? It's so small. It's so buried. It's so hidden, but it's so large, you know, and, and seeing him in such a large place trying to it, capture that you know that's not it. it it didn't work you you know um but the record i feel like i'm in i'm in those rooms in those in those you know concrete castle basements or wherever the hell these weird elvish children are making this music it's incredible so what i wanted to ask about was whether cultural appropriation is any kind of a a hit on this band or whether that's less of a thing in music than it is in other art forms. Um, Because you, you hear this and you're, I mean, I was, I was pretty surprised to learn that this was being made by a 21 year old kid from Albuquerque. Uh, It feels like he should be infusing and repurposing stuff that is his heritage and everything he grew up on and not, not should, but that is the impression that the music gives me as a listener. And so is is that something that is problematic in the way that people talk about this kind of music or is it less of a, an issue in the music community, I, I guess? It, it, could be, it could be problematic in the way that people talk about it depending on what they're saying, right? I mean, this record led me to Costa Rica's films. It led me to... You keep saying... Co- this, is, sl- this is the second time you've said Costa Rica's Amir films. Costa Rica. Do you mean Costa Rica? Amir Costa Rica? Costa Rica? I don't know yeah. who this is. Yeah. Look up underground and then okay. Costa Rica with a K. So it, it just got me into um, Hungarian, Yugoslavian, Gulag music and, and um, 
so it opened my eyes to a, a musical is it not his name <laughs> no it is his name that's just the funniest oh, picture, picture i've ever <laughs> seen everybody go look up this guy's imdb uh picture it's <laughs> adorable <laughs> yeah that is a really cute picture of that guy um so i would say that he used a musical tradition that um is obviously loved with every ounce of his body and if you love something like that and it inspires you to pay humpage to it, then great, you know? And if that's black music, if that's you pre-war Yugoslavian music, if it's, you know, it doesn't matter what the person looked like that made it. I think if you love it truly and it leaks into your work, like that's not a politically correct decision your brain is making or it's it shouldn't be thought of, I don't think. I mean, you know, I, some, tons of people love to say that like, Paul Simon went to South Africa, took their music, underpaid their musicians and like made a South African record and dipped. But he drew so much beautiful attention to a place that Americans at the time were not paying enough attention to and a, and a rich tradition, a rich culture that was a stone left unturned for Americans. I mean, it's kind of like saying like Ram Dass going to India, but being a New York Jew and being able to be like, or a Boston Jew and being able to be, to relate uh, India's rich tradition in, in, in a way that there wasn't as much of a language barrier and like these hip American and English intellectuals could jive with, you know, at the time. And I think that's again that's just that's just culture spreading in the ways that it spreads and i think that um if there's anything risky about beirut's music i would say it's the name beirut that's what i wanted to talk about next yeah, yeah but 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 i don't but i don't think of yeah i don't think i shouldn't be allowed to rap or i don't think um he shouldn't be you know and and like a lot of that tradition that 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 he's borrowing is a very white tradition too it's just, or maybe not. Maybe that's an uninformed thing to say. But it's, but it's very um, European, and and um, I think he does have ties to Europe. I forget where in his journey, because you're right. Albuquerque is the big surprise. That's the like, what? Yeah, really? You know. But I think there's some rich. You know, I think that guy was. He, he must have. And if he's, if it's, it's more impressive if he's not, if he's never been to Paris in his life and he's never been to Europe and he's, and he's just, he just loves this music. I mean, great. I'd, I'd take that too. But I, I'm pretty sure that he has some, some like, you know, culture, some vast cultural ties to, to, to the music that he's making. All right. So what, what do you think of the title then? Or the, the name eh, Beirut? Pass. 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 All right. Uh, I don't think it's the best band yeah. name, but I also, how old was he? He was young, you know, young, younger than 21. 21. Yeah. yeah. Second album. And he's so, probably 19 when he's naming it. Yeah. That's what, yeah. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I know what it's like to be young and have a shitty band name because you don't think about it too much. Okay. I, I, I was wondering whether that would uh, influence <laughs> your answer. <laughs> what do you think? I think it's careless. I think it is a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he's he's use he's he's playing on cultural associations uh, with with violence and with death uh, to yeah. to create yeah. sort of a you know he's saying oh it's well my my music is about these collisions of style and these collisions of influences um, but you know a lot of it does I think come down to being has a, he been a kid. asked about it yeah uh, I found some interview quotes. Um, from around so when the you time. just said yeah the, the the reason he named the project that was because of the style of, yeah yeah he no, says yeah. it's a good analogy for Not my music enough. uh i imagine i haven't been to beirut but i imagine it as this chic urban city surrounded by the ancient muslim world the place where things collide it's 2006 yeah. he's 20 years old when he says that it's yeah. in, in yeah, new yeah, york yeah, yeah. magazine and that's you know. That's what to keep in mind, and he does. He does. He does get referred to as Zach Condon. I think, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would be nice. I don't know what he's released music as recently. Beirut. But I, Beirut's got an album coming out this year. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems it, it's never too late, Zach. It's never too late. Yeah, but the yeah, but I and and weirdly enough, that place doesn't make any sense really within the context of the music. I don't know if it does. I'm not sure. Neither am Especially, I. Especially yeah. like I'm not sure what what music what traditional music from Beirut sounds like, but 
um, maybe it'd be maybe it'd be fascinating to hear it um, and see if there's any through lines musically, because it seems like random to me, a little bit. Have you tracked the progression of his sound at all over the past decades, fifteen years? Mm, some there was like this March of the Zapotec or uh, record that he did that was uh, kind of new and exciting. Yeah, in some sonic ways that I remember really liking. and um, But yeah, the first two, the first two records, specifically the first one, if I'm being honest, um, are just, that's, that's my bread and butter. So what what's the um, experimentation in Zapotec? I'd have to refresh myself, but I think it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of, um, maybe it's that uh, after the first two, maybe he took a dip more into the traditional songwriter, uh, format like maybe the records got a little bit more produced and to my ears it was getting less and less special and more and more like you know assimilated to the modern indie sound but i think zapotec was like hey i worked with like only horns players and played only ukulele with like a horn it was i think it's very orchestrated in a in a um in that way that kind of the first two records lean on heavily and you know because he does tracks that get just electronic music he does tracks that are just you know but um but yeah i think it was like kind of a return to form almost there's one thing i wanted to highlight um one little little flourish that i really liked um that kind of struck me this time in a way it hasn't before it's it's uh on track five which is an instrumental track uh it starts with a little clip of audio that is the sort of airport, if you see something, say something. And in terms of placing these things culturally with with where things were falling in 2007, that is such a Bush era flourish to me, this, mm. the way that, that the idea of world travel and travel internationally and, and travel on an airplane had become less something thrilling than something a little bit paranoid. Um, and there was all these yeah. new restrictions that I think when, when so much of the sound of the album is about pulling together all these world traditions to have this reminder that also this is a world that is a little paranoid or, or I am coming at all of this from a country that is very paranoid of world influences. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's, cool. that's super, that's super cool. And, and I think that also we're, we're talking a lot about like musical tourism and we're talking about like when that's okay and when it's not okay. And to know that he's kind of self-aware to an, a certain extent of like, don't want to go to the airport because you're afraid, like <laughs> just come, come to Beirut, come to this place, come to this band and, and travel the world with me yeah. because I know these records you don't know and I'm making music as a kid and it's, it's you know, yeah. I don't know. That's, that's cool. It's cool to point out. And yeah, I think that concept of musical tourism, I think is super relatable to the discussion of this artist specifically. I also really liked the, uh, that I found the 2006 interview where he, put himself directly in opposition to Gogol Bordello. Oh. So he was he was directly saying, like, I know that people compare me to Gogol Bordello, but what makes that band work is the fact that the singer dresses crazy. And so he was pushing back against that comparison, which I thought was telling and, and makes a lot of sense. I think that they're I think that the lead singer of Gogo Bordello has more a little bit more obvious street cred when it comes to the musical tradition he's a part oh, of. Do, do, you, do you think so? <laughs> I kind of do. Interesting, yeah. I think that guy. I'm being sarcastic. He's is, from the part of the world oh, that his okay, music yeah. is coming yeah, that, from. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think I. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not sure. I can. I. I would. I would prefer to not think about it <laughs> and i would prefer to just enjoy the record so but, pass is what you're saying yeah yeah so back to my original pass pass do you want to uh do you have a closing argument or have we just done it i can't i can't name anything else that sounds like it that's like modern like right like do, can you compare it to anything Gogol Bordello. Besides, bes <laughs> yeah, besides old music yeah. and not Gogol Bordello. Well, Graceland, I do. I, I, in terms of just the the thinking about using world influences, sure. You, you sure. mean Graceland came up and and you his mentioned his voice. Too. Can you can you compare his voice to anybody? I don't think so. Russell. Yeah, Russell Ritchie. That's my mind thought of that too. Our friend who sang yeah. this song in our acapella group uh, uh, did not. His voice right? Sounds yeah. a lot like him. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's yeah no no it's a great record. I'm so glad we talked about it, and I'm I'm so glad it exists. And and um, yeah, I would love to hear. There'll probably be a way to comment or let me know what you think about this musical tourism. We'll make sure there too. is. I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to hear what people think about that because I think it's a tricky one. And I think, um, you know, I like this record, um, and that has nothing to do with whether or not I should. <laughs> um, and I think that's a trickier question. So yeah, my my ears are open. I'd say. Yeah. It's in the time capsule. Yay. It's still bouncing. There it goes. <laughs> Every time I do that, I imagine the end of Empire Strikes Back when he tells him he's his pops uh-huh. and he screams, no. Uh-huh. It's like this big circular cylindrical right. shaft, mm-hmm. you know, yep. that like, that's what our, that's, our time capsule is that big. Oh, wow. That's, that makes head. sense. That's, that's yeah. what it has to be. And that's the sound that yep. huge mile diameter <laughs> cylindrical space station makes it's It's a cloud city please what i just throw in there So I'm so excited to welcome to the podcast uh, Sydney Urbanek, who is the writer behind the newsletter Monon and Mythology and an editor for Brightwall Dark Room and just an all around really admirable person that you should uh, make sure to seek out and read. Uh, Sydney, thank you so much for being here. Wow. Thank you so much for, for having me here and for that intro. It's very You're nice. So welcome. Uh, so <laughs> Sydney is here to contribute to our time capsule, the What Goes Around Comes Around Music Video, parentheses, long version, right? By Justin Timberlake. Is that Mm -hmm. how we would phrase that? Good. Um, But before we get to that, there's there's the opening question that I like to ask, and I'm particularly curious uh, to know your answer. What was going on in 2007? Where where were you at? Where was I at? Wow, I was 11. That's that's you're, so, you are the youngest of our uh, our participants so far. So I'm I'm curious what 2007 means to an 11 year old. That's funny. Yeah, I um, yeah, I was I turned 11 in 2007 and switched from grade six into middle school. So I switched schools. It was a big year. Um, it's funny. I hadn't really thought in prepping for this. I hadn't really asked myself that question yet. So now I'm thinking, oh. I get it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's this is not a conversation necessarily about Britney Spears, but when I think like 2007, that's of course like the year that that was what you know I talked about on the playground at the beginning of the year when I was at the kind of school where there I was on the playground, and then when I go to middle school, everyone's still talking about it, but now in the context of being a middle schooler, and it's a more like not grown up context but maybe slightly more relatively speaking a little bit more grown up i get that yeah how a sixth grader talks about britney spears versus how a seventh grader does that's that there's a huge shift there for real totally yeah so uh you know i i asked you here because you are the number one sort of music video aficionado in my life um and sort of you know in in the twitter sphere you know you are you are i think one of our leading music video scholars. I'm just going to throw that down as the gauntlet. Um, so what I was yeah. curious about is kind of what it was, what, it, what is it that makes this your art form? Cause, cause some people, um, see these things as, as throwaways. Um, some people see them as essentially advertisements and, and not worthy of, of a whole lot more, uh, analysis than a magazine ad. But for you, they are these these subjects of, of analysis. And so I was curious kind of what, what leads you to that and, and why. Well, I mean, the short of it for me is that the artists that I gravitate towards the most um, that would lead me to do something like get a master's degree in cinema studies, but sort of specialize in that, you know, cinematic medium in particular, um, 
are the ones who don't treat them as throwaways. Um, they absolutely start, you know, for the for the average artist and initially as like a there's like a utilitarian function to them. Advertising is the obvious one, but so is it's way easier to send a clip of yourself performing overseas than it is to travel with everyone and everything and perform it live, whether, you know, on like the Ed Sullivan show or Top of the Pops. Um, I always watched them growing up. Um, they were always something I loved just like having, I, so I'm, I'm Canadian. So it wasn't so much that I had MTV on all the time as I would have much music on and they did. Um, by the time I was actually paying attention to TV and music videos on TV, it was countdowns that they did. Like the, it wasn't, it wasn't 24 hour music television so much as, um, there'd be regular like TV programming. And then occasionally they do hours of music videos back to back. I'd always watch those. Um, but by the time of like, you know, even this video or, you know, 10 or so years into my life, that they stopped having so many of those countdowns on TV and my life became about YouTube. So the, the, the deal is that I was always very into music videos and simultaneously I was always very into movies. I never really thought of the two things as being related. Um, I just knew that I liked Britney Spears as a kid and then I knew that I liked Lady Gaga as a high schooler and I knew that I liked Beyonce as an undergrad student um, and it was halfway through so, so when I was an undergrad student in film I found that I so I privately like outside of school hours I was a big Beyonce fan I was very into these like very power this very powerful sliver of the music industry that was always doing really interesting things visually um, who can afford to do something like go out and make like an hour long film companion piece for their album. Um, and I found that I was always bringing them up in class. Like the conversation would be about star studies. It would be about, um, you know, anything more traditionally film studies. And I was always, people used to laugh at me because I was always finding reasons to bring up like Beyonce in class. Um, and then Lemonade came out in the second half of my undergrad and suddenly my professors wanted to talk about Beyonce and it was like the tables had turned suddenly I wasn't so um I wasn't wrong <laughs> there was I was onto something I had been onto something and now I had reasons to think about the two things in relation to each other like film studies and also music video artists and these artists that seem to think of themselves as like auteurs who start production houses in order to control like their visual output um, and it kind of just snowballed from there. Like it, I was, I started writing for the internet about that before it occurred to me that I might go back to school and do that like in a, in an official capacity. But that's what I did end up doing was going back to school and getting a master's degree in cinema studies, but where I was the like pop star person. Um, and initially I went, like my application was that I was going to go and study like the evolution of the visual album and the way that I always used to phrase it was like from something, um, from a hard day's night or purple rain all the way through to something like lemonade. And my program was very short, uh, relatively speaking, it was only a year. And I had a professor tell me, you can't fit this into a master's thesis. It's too big. Um, you'll pull your hair out trying to make this like a synthesized story. Um, and what ended up happening was I knew that I was already going, I knew that I wanted to write about stuff like Lemonade, stuff like Beyonce's self-titled album. Um, and this name that kept popping up through all of these projects was Jonas Ockerland, um, whose work I just, in, in my personal life, have always really gravitated towards. And so that ended up being like my plan B thesis was I still found a way to talk about like visual albums, music films, but um, through this very different, very Swedish lens. And then, yeah, that's kind of, uh, I, I think I started this answer by being like, well, the short of it is, and then 
didn't give you the short version, but I think that answers probably answers your question. Totally, yeah. So let's just take it, take it, take it from the top of this video. I guess you you mentioned um, that you had a sort of a list of potential ideas, but that that once this one uh, sort of crossed your eye, you realized the 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 game was over. So what is it? Uh, what is it about this video? Why is this the one that that felt like jumped out to you? Well, first my brain went to Britney Spears. That's what I'll say first, and I was thinking like you know, what defines pop culture that year? And in some ways it's her very hard to watch performance at the VMAs that year when like she should not have been on stage. Um, is there anything about that performance that, that might have stuck in people's minds? Like, is there an image from that one? That was the year that she performed Gimme More. Um, it was a lip synced performance in an obvious way. It was the same, it was, you know, seven months after she'd shaved her head. Um, it was sort of that, like, that year. Okay. Um, sort of a cursed year if you were a fan, which I was, um, and I still am. But so part of that story in some ways was Justin Timberlake. And when I remembered this video and I watched it back, I was, you know, he falls into that category of artists who are interesting to me because they're trying to do these more ambitious, um, not three minute advertisements of just, there's just like a performance element happening. He's also trying to like, you know, blur the lines of, of genre. What's a music video? What's a feature film? Um, there was a lot of talk about making this one that they wanted to do like, another thriller, which I think is very ambitious, but that's yep. <laughs> very consistent with, um, with Justin Timberlake in the sense that he's always seen himself in the lineage of like a Michael Jackson. Uh, that's a name that for as long as Justin Timberlake has been a public figure, Michael Jackson has been mentioned. Um, and of course, pulling from like, you know, the Cassavetes family adds an interesting dynamic to it. There's a real like, you know, pulling from Scarlett Johansson for the casting. We should say so it's it's Nick Cassavetes wrote the screenplay or the screenplay for for this video, yes. So Yeah, he wrote I mean, in all the writing about this video, it, it keeps being phrased as he wrote the dialogue. So I wonder if he was handed like a treatment and he just filled in the actual words. Um of which there are not all that many. No, there aren't that many. Um, the other thing that's interesting is, ugh, this is maybe tangential. It's definitely <laughs> tangential, but Please. around this time, Justin Timberlake is in a bunch of movies. Um, that's not so much tangential, but he's he decides to make a, a bunch of movies. Various reasons for that. One of them is that it's just, it's time. There comes a time in every pop star's life when they try to like make a few movies. But in his case also... The 2004 Super Bowl was the year where he and Janet Jackson had performed and, you know, Nipplegate, if you will. Yeah. And after that happened, the obvious move was not to just, like, make another album and get into promoing it. He tried to sort of, like, make his image a little more interesting, try something new. I don't know if it—I think to some extent that may have been, like, let's make sure that I'm still—that I can set up another, like, viable— pillar of my persona in his case um but anyway one of those movies is shrek the third right where yep. he plays uh, i think his name's archie but so also in that movie of course is cameron diaz he starts dating cameron diaz um oh. and then you know if you're talking about like cameron diaz's thoughts summarize like her, her filmography wise a lot of it comes back to Nick Cassavetes um because he does my sister's keeper he does the other woman um several years later I don't know if that's relevant at all Cameron Diaz to the story but it feels like it might be the fact that Nick Cassavetes suddenly joins this project I know he's also friends with Samuel Bayer but I know also that Hollywood's just very small so yeah, but in the end, there's this, it's an interesting chapter of Justin Timberlake's career where he's um, 
the closest to the movie world that he's ever been. And it starts to show in his work. So I think that's what it is about, about this video. Um, so you mentioned Samuel Bayer, who is the, the director. Um, is that a name that uh, is, is familiar? I mean, it seems like he's primarily works in music videos. Yeah, he's, I mean, technically he's like a multidisciplinary artist. He's done some really interesting, like, um, he's done a lot of photography. He's done a little painting. He's best known um, to most people, I'd say, for doing the Smells Like Teen Spirit video for Nirvana. Oh, wow. yeah. And I imagine that's probably his most famous project, but he's also done lots of things that, you know, even um, were a big part of my childhood, like all of the Green Day videos from American Idiot. That's all him. Um, he did some work with Bowie, I believe. I hope I'm not making that up. I don't think so. But yeah, so that's the other thing is like he, Justin Timberlake has hired this very important name in this world, obviously is trying to you know, write himself into music video history. Um, it's an interesting time too, because it's like a transitional era in the music video worlds where like TRL is winding down. YouTube is starting to encroach on the industry in a way that's very bad for like everyone's bottom line. Um, and it start, it shows in the release method of this one, which is that it becomes like an iTunes exclusive for a bit. And it's the only place you can buy it which means it by default becomes like the best-selling video on itunes because <laughs> that was right. the only option if you wanted to see it um so that's also an interesting like part of this story is the fact that justin timberlake is trying to make this very ambitious video at a time where it's kind of risky to do that um because it's not quite the youtube era where they've monetized figured out a way to monetize things which starts to happen post vivo which doesn't happen until like 2009. Um, but YouTube has existed for about a year, I guess, at this point. Sounds right. So um, you mentioned Britney Spears, but how, uh, how, how does her sort of shadow inform this? Oh, yes, of course. So way back when, um, around like the turn of the millennium, the two of them had been a couple. Uh, they had they had gone way back in terms of being co-stars on the all new Mickey Mouse Club, and then nice. their breakup sort of overshadows his solo debut, um, which is 2002. He puts out his first album. They've broken up earlier that year, and his first single does like his his first single from that album is like I Love You. It does okay. Um, he goes back to the drawing board and he releases Cry Me a River as the second single from the album. And that one is more or less accusing her um, indirectly of having cheated on him. So in terms of like, you know, myth making, if you will, neither of them had been all that forthcoming about like the nature of their breakup, but he decided to get on top of the narrative first because she was just going to say nothing. And so um, a really crucial part of his like solo rise to fame is that he's like the scorned ex. Um, and that's, you know, 2002, 2003, as he's promoting it. And then when it comes to do his second solo studio album, which is the one that has what goes around on it, um, this is Future Sex Love Songs in 2006. It's his second second album. He says to his production team, I want to do another Cry Me a River. And supposedly what he meant was in terms of like impact uh, scale. Like I want to do another real, you know, water cooler kind of video. But I think it's yeah. very easy and understandable to read what goes around as a sort of sequel to Cry Me a River because they follow like, even musically, they follow like virtually the same structure. They both concern uh, like cheating blonde, who is, you know, in the case of the second video, she's like doing things for attention. Um, the official story was that the breakup that he had sung about was inspired by 
his best friends break up. And this was with like Canadian actress, Alicia Cuthbert, um, who was also blonde. Basically it, it becomes a sequel to Cry Me a River directly, but also indirectly. And it's less that he's intentionally trying to invoke Britney Spears again, so much as, as he puts this song out, um, her personal life, professional life starts to crumble. And what ends up happening, um, you know, even if we're talking accidentally, it's still like an optical thing is he's promoting this, like you got what you just, de- what you deserved, like karmic retribution song as she's like embroiled in this, um, really ugly divorce battle. She's like losing custody of her kids. She's being, um, involuntarily held in psychiatric hospitals and so that was like the regardless of what he intended to do it's what ended up happening and it has become this sort of weird cloud over the story um of him promoting it and also there's lots of clips like he'd go on oprah to talk about his recent career success and his album and perform this song but he'd be asked about britney spears and it's like the two things sort of got tangled together in terms of the narrative of that whole project. He had a really good year in um, 2006 and then 2007. He was like on top of the world. Um, His first album had done like pretty well. It had done fine, but this was the album of the decade uh, between the two for him, for sure. Sure. So we should maybe sort of run through the events of the video for anybody who didn't watch it in preparation for this conversation, in which case, shame on you. Um, <laughs> would you would you like to do the honors, give a little overview of this? I'd be curious to hear how it sort of plays in your mind. Yeah, so do you know off the top of your head what the runtime is? Is it seven minutes? Um, I think the video itself is about nine minutes. The song is about seven. Okay. Okay, yeah. So basically... Justin Timberlake playing a you know a character who's presumably not Justin Timberlake, but he's not given a name, so I'll just call him Justin Timberlake. Meets Scarlett Johansson, who's a sort of uh, feisty blonde out at a party, and starts to date her. We see them in bed together. He introduces her to his friend as the one. Um, and there's, you know, several shots that suggest that the friend is interested in her and she might be interested in him or at least curious. Her, you know, her curiosity's peaked, his curiosity's peaked. And early in the video, she pretends to drown for attention, um, which is another thing I'll come back to because that also sort of accidentally or inadvertently put it in conversation with a previous Britney Spears project. Um yeah, eventually Justin finds his best friend and this lady making out in the hallway or in the stairwell. Uh, she, they, they, you know, there's an altercation. She gets in a car. She ends up totaling the car in this very interesting, bizarre reference to Butterfield 8. Um, Which I, I don't know what that is. So it's that Elizabeth Taylor movie. I haven't actually seen it, I should say. But um, the main character, I think her name's Gloria, played by Elizabeth Taylor, dies like in virtually the same way with, I think, certain shots actually having been recreated for this video. So that's kind of how it ends. Like, you know, what goes around comes around. Um, Simultaneously, we get shots of him performing the song with this, like, you know, vintage condenser mic, um... I think that covers it. Yeah, it's a sort of jam-packed, sort of a little action movie, melodrama, yeah. <laughs> all in one. Yeah, it is. It is high melodrama, certainly with that that ending, especially. Um, it also it strikes me as as more than a little bit misogynist. Is that is that fair to say? I think it's very fair to say. Personally. Um, I think a lot of people, especially in the last few years, have sort of realized that, like, I really admire him as an artist. I think he's very talented. Um, That has not changed for me, but I think there's a lot of, a lot you can say about the way that his solo career for the first 10 years was 
predicated on these like sinister you did this to me and now you're getting you're like it, again like a, a karmic retribution kind of thing um cry me a river is the video where he again like this blonde woman unnamed but dressed as britney spears has cheated on him and so he breaks into her house watches her shower and then leaves like a scary video on a video camera that he happened to find and um this is not unlike that i don't think um lyrically it also like really hammers that particular thing home um in the sense that it's very like yeah so in in what goes around he's saying like tale as old as time girl you got what you deserved and yeah it's i'm not saying that that's really justin timberlake but you know in terms of a star persona thing it was true that a massive part of his branding around this time was that he'd been wronged by this blonde and he needed to like take care of it somehow or in this case that it was taken care of um in fact there's a very like femme fatale we got to kill this woman off because she's a troublemaker right yeah kind of thing happening um yeah sinister is a word that i kept thinking of in prepping for this but of course it's like it's a role that he was playing right um i don't want to i don't want to conflate his real personality with these characters that he's playing in the video but it is true that it was a really dominant thread that he continued to come back to sure yeah it's that that line uh girl you get what you deserve and then it smash cuts to the the fiery car wreck is a striking gesture yeah. and, and not not the best way <laughs> no it's really interesting because um in both cases, I mean, obviously we're talking about this one video, but in both videos, the lyrics take on these extra sinister meanings when you pair them with like what the actual um, punishment is. So in the first video, I mean, both of them are, are collaborations between Timberlake and Timbaland. And in the first video, Timbaland's being like, all right, like the damage is done. So I guess I'll be leaving. And, you know, in the original song, the damage is this woman who's cheated and her cheating. And now it's become, we've just trashed your house. <laughs> That's the damage like that we've done uh, to you. And in this video, yeah, it's definitely a dark, he, he wasn't obviously all that scared to be playing this particular role. I think also, the way that all of these videos were received so well at the time. There, there was pushback, um, like minor pushback at the time, but for the most part, like massive hits, won him Grammys, won their directors VMAs. Like there was no real critical um, reaction to them in the sense of like, hey, <laughs> I don't know about this particular, you know, uh, uh, argument that you are suggesting is the one we should all be believing with you, that sort of thing. So again, like it's not even like uh, that anything was maliciously happening, just that the the pairing of that narrative plus like what was going on for real in Britney Spears' life looked really bad. Even if, you know, we go with his official story that it was about his best friend breaking up with Alicia Cuthbert, um, which I believe I believe him when he says that either way there's like a real life woman that's being targeted and would have to suffer some fallout um so yeah <laughs> yeah so i i <laughs> i was thinking a lot about the the screenplay here given that it is it is the rare video that has the the screenplay credit this feels like a, a screenplay written by a 12 year old to me like how how 12 year olds think that a breakup would go and how grown-ups talk you know, throwing each other around going, you're my best friend, man. Well, I like her too. That was my, my favorite part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure why you needed a credited screenwriter for this. It feels like an acting exercise at times. Um, like you're just improving on the theme of, of a confrontation. I don't know. Um, that element did not, did not strike me as, as the most brag worthy. I think it really just comes back to like, hey guys, it's Justin Timberlake, remember me? I'm the actor, as opposed to, you know. Um, yeah. I think that was part of it. 
I imagine, you know, also like in 2004, a few, a couple years before this video was filmed, Nick Cassavetes had done the notebook, which is, right. I think probably arguably to this day, his biggest film in terms of directing. Um, th there's a lot to say, I think about that the actual like director and writers and stars appear on screen at the beginning of the video, because, you know, when, when artists do that, they want you to like clock it. Um, it's also, a, it's it, that in that sense, it's a very like thriller type thing where it's like, we want you to know this is not just a music video. This is like a short movie that I've made something that makes it more. I don't really think this, uh, I don't like to think of it this way, but I think it's like a thing artists do and they want to like legitimize, you know, it's like, it comes back to like, you know, elevated horror. It's like, okay, it's a music video, but like, it's also a piece of art. Like we've, it's it's legit guys because i had a director and a writer and two stars th or three stars they all come from hollywood um yeah yeah so you said there was something about the swimming pool that you wanted to to come back to oh yeah so it's it's brief and again like probably accidental but worth mentioning i think is that britney spears's response in early 2004 to cry me a river was every time um and in that video she drowns um or hits her head and and passes out in her bathtub and and ultimately dies in the video and it's there's a lot happening in terms of like there's a famous couple that's under stress because they're a couple but also because they're famous and she's accidentally injured and passes out in the bathtub but in the last few seconds of the video she opens her eyes and sits up in the bath and then has this little laugh to herself as if we've kind of just been played. Um, and so one way of looking at the Scarlett Johansson pretending to drown for attention is exactly that. Like, you know, regardless of whether he meant to continue the thread even more than it had already been continued, it's, it's a really interesting if it's a coincidence, it's a pretty curious one, is what I'll say. Gotcha. Yeah. It's also like, you know, I think one of the things this video does is make us hate Scarlett Johansson's character so yeah. that when she does, it's like, you know, again, it's like the whole like erotic thriller, 90s erotic thriller thing. Like when she dies, we're like, oh, thank God, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Which is maybe like our, an, in, an, an instinct that's worth interrogating a little. Yeah. Well, it's, it's when I mentioned the sort of misogynistic tropes that it felt like it was playing on to me. It's, it's that she has this private moment at one point where she's out drinking with, with Timberlake and his best friend. And his best friend sort of makes a pass at her and she looks away towards the camera, but away from them and just has this evil look in her eyes. And it's like, Really, you're you're hitting the nail on the head there, but it's a music video. You got to you know work in broad strokes, I guess, to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I I sometimes wonder to come back to what you said about um, the dialogue feeling very like you know school play. We're yeah. putting on a skit. Um, you wonder how much of that is like making it as bare bones and not complex as possible, so that it can be like chopped up. Yeah potentially shortened for TV, like all that stuff. Yeah. Like I think, you know, videos like this, it's, it was an, it would have been an ambitious ask in terms of TV, like broadcast to be like, Hey, I made something. It's almost 10 minutes. But again, it's the sort of thing that he would have done to put himself like, you know, channel the artistic spirit of Michael Jackson, who was at that, at this point still around. But I just mean in the sense that like, he's trying to, you know, one like ungenerous reading would be that he's trying to be difficult and like artistically demanding and that this is the result. Um, but in case they did need to like cleave a few minutes out, um, the dialogue is so sparse that it technically doesn't even need to be there at all. Like if they really needed to just like um, truncate it into only the musical bits, like that's something they could have done. Yeah, the camera work in this video is interesting too because it's all it's I think it's entirely handheld. 
Yeah, it's, it's very, it's got like a verite style, especially in the dialogue moments where it steps away from, from the song. Mm-hmm. So we've, we've hit all my notes and all my questions. You, you got ahead of me on a bunch of this stuff. Is there, is there anything that you have that we missed? Um, wow. I don't know. I kept saving, I saved all these notes and then I barely consulted them, which is, don't know if that's a good sign. I'll call it a good sign. Yeah. Like the other thing in bringing up Brittany so much, it sounds like I'm trying to like retroactively force this narrative on the video. But one of the other things that like, um, I don't know if you want to call them like eagle eyed fans of hers noticed is that this, this title, the title of this song was often stylized as like what goes around dot, dot, dot comes around. And that's something that is unusual for, you know, the recording industry in general, but it's something that he had never done before. Um, I don't think he's ever done it since, but Britney was sort of famous for it. Right. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it was like they couldn't call baby one more time, hit me baby one more time. So it was, a, it ended up being called dot, dot, dot baby one more time. And then there was, oops, exclamation point, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. I did it again. It was just something that was like a, it was like a trademark of hers. And so I think, Fairly, that was one of the interesting things about this project that led people to believe that it was meant to be seen as like a continuation of that existing thread from several years beforehand. Um, the only the only other thing to say about this song and this video are that they did extremely well. Um, won him a Grammy. Samuel Bear won like Best Direction at the VMAs for it, which is one of the like real since 2006 most vmas have been fan voted but they have six uh what they call professional categories that are actually like some unknown you know group of industry professionals votes on them and best direction is one of the ones that are considered to be legit so it is a good video like one of the reasons why i wanted to talk about it was that it's like it's genuinely of that crop it was it's a good video it's not entirely about the something that I think I have a, a habit of focusing too much on at risk of um, not focusing enough on like the technical aspects, which is like the drama of it all and all the like yeah. extra text. Um, but, you know, I would argue that the extra text, as this conversation suggests, is like a crucial part of the way that the video is meant to be watched and talked about. And yeah. Just looking through my notes here, I feel like I just talked at you for many, many minutes. That's that's exactly what I what I was hoping for, and I'm so glad you did. What do you think of this video? Boy, um, like I said, I think it's kind of gross. Um, I think it is is locked into a very uh, an, an aesthetic that feels sort of of the time, um, almost like Moulin Rouge adjacent. Um, the sort mm. of well, the the fedora certainly has not yet become the uh, ironic <laughs> image that it is now right. that, he's, that he's wearing the whole time. The sort of the distressed, uh, sort of crushed velvet club, um, like I say, Moulin Rouge adjacent. That just that really jumped out to me as as locking it in this moment. Um, it reminded me of Sin City a bunch too. Uh, the the opening meeting on a rooftop, the sort of rear projection, uh, car chase, um, and I think this song, like I said, is uh, maybe off before we were recording. Has has been in my head uh, for two straight days, and that you know, if nothing else, is is an achievement because it is it's an earworm. Yeah, I mean, as critical as I can be of this man and this video this song this is a great album like i have no no real notes on it it's it was a big deal for a reason um especially compared to the first one his first one which was like you know there are some there are some bops on it but for the most part this is the project um i mean i think they were both technically timbaland collaborations but this one i think defines this album, not Cry Me River, but like the actual album compared to the first one defines this. It feels, it feels very, uh, as you say, like of, feels very 2007. Um, they went right into making, right from making this album into making 
Timbaland's album, uh, Shock Value, which is also a really great album. Like they, they both of them just happened to be in a very good artistic groove around this time. And um, the music is great. Like it, it's still great. It holds up uh, musically. It holds up on the ear. I don't know if all of the, the gossip, um, the gossip elements hold up through like a circa 2022 feminist lens as we've been talking about um there's an interesting Bayer quote I think he was interviewed by MTV and he was saying like you know I wanted to do a throwback like make a thriller for 25 years later a thriller for the new generation something larger than life but instead of monsters and Vincent Price we have car crashes and a very beautiful girl (laughs) you know and I think it's it's a very like 2000s you know concept like we're gonna have things explode we're gonna we're gonna have a cheating blonde and she's gonna be scarlett johansson because this will be the craziest thing ever that we've done um and you know people responded to it the way that they were meant to so through that lens very successful very successful well that that feels like a pretty good button um unless unless you have anything else like i say that's that's jumping out to be said the only thing that just came to mind, and this is for sure the like really the last thing, uh, last thing this time, is that just to come back to the whole like explosions thing, um, there were some injuries, some onset injuries for this oh, video. God. Like Justin broke his finger, and this was like right before he was supposed to go on tour, where he was like playing the piano on that tour, so it was a bit of a like concern. Um, the physical fighting that happens left like everyone very bruised, like. Johansson had a bruise that she thought was like super cool because she was like, wow, we've really been like giving it our all on this set. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those other things that adds to the like the lore of the project is the way that these there's like a almost like a Michael Bay sensibility, I think, to this yeah. project um, a few different ways. But yeah, it feels very of its of its time. And I think more interesting than like a lot of videos, even still like, in terms of just like, you know, I admire anyone that's going to spend some money, actually do something, try and get people talking. Um, and again, it's those artists that I, that I find that I can write about um, whose work actually like begs discussion of some kind where you could even have like a podcast conversation like this. Yeah. So the kind of thing that you write about once again at your newsletter, Mononym Mythology, which where can people find that? So the best one stop place for me would be Twitter and everything is like there in my little link tree. But technically the URL is sidurbanek.ghost.io. That's another way to you know get it direct. But again, because I'm chronically online, uh, Twitter is a, is a good place to see anything I'm up to. Um, as far as work goes. What a Year is produced by me, Ethan Warren, with original music by my co-host Ryan Polly. Thanks to Brian Rosemeyer for the mixing and mastering, and Shane Butler and the good folks at Portray Me for our artwork. Please take a few minutes to follow us on your podcasting app of choice. And while you're doing that, if you could leave a rating and just a quick little review, it really does make a difference. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at What A Year Pod. On our next episode, we're going to be talking about Danny Boyle's Sunshine and Justice's album Cross, plus Patton Oswalt's Werewolves and Lollipops with guest Joe Quizala. It's going to be a good one. <laughs>